Hello and welcome again, everyone, to our Cash for College FAFSA 101 webinar. My name is Mae Whiting. I am the Data and Research Manager at Alabama Possible. And today, we're mostly going to focus on preparing your students for completing the FAFSA. So most of what we cover today are going to be steps of preparation, but we will have other FAFSA related webinars upcoming that will get into much more detail related to that actual FAFSA form. So just wanted to give you a heads up there. So we couldn't do any of this work without uh, the partnership of our sponsors. They generously provide us with funding so that we are able to provide these trainings to all of you for free. So thank you so much to all of the sponsors you see listed here. And then we also have our wonderful partners who are joining us in this work. So we partner with Alabama Commission on Higher Education, Alabama Community College System, Alabama State Department of Ed Education, and then Get Educated, which is the Common Black College application. So a few housekeeping notes before we get started. If you wouldn't mind, please keeping your microphones on mute at all times to avoid any feedback during the presentation. This webinar is going to be recorded. All of our professional development training webinars are recorded and then posted to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Alabama Possible. So I'm going to drop that link in the chat for you. At any point throughout today's webinar, you are welcome to ask questions. You can do that by adding those questions to the chat feature of Zoom. And then we will have a few moments throughout the webinar where we'll pause for questions because it is a bit of a lengthy webinar. But then any other question we'll kind of save towards the end and address it there. We did receive several questions through the registration form that you completed to be able to join us today. So we'll also address those as well. And then throughout today's webinar, we are going to have several poll questions. We would love your participation in those polls. Um, especially for our high school educators who are looking to get professional development credit. You'll need to complete the poll questions that are all the way towards the end of today's webinar in order to be eligible for your professional development credit. So I'll give you a reminder there. All right, we would love if you would share your commitment to building a college going culture on social media. You can find us on these social media platforms at AL Goes to College. That's the number two, at AL Goes to College. And then while we're working to support students through the financial aid process, um, we would love it if you would utilize the financial aid related hashtags, such as hashtag Pell yes, hashtag FAFSA, hashtag cash for college. Our first poll question, which you should see on your screen now, is how comfortable are you with the FAFSA? So we would love to just gauge your level of comfort towards the beginning, and hopefully by the end of today's session, you do feel a little more comfortable. Understandably, um, I'm sure everyone would love more trainings on this topic. So like I mentioned, we'll have a few more leading up to the FAFSA's launch date. All right, so it looks like um, almost everyone has responded. And our most common response is somewhat comfortable with 36% of folks responding at that level. So kind of middle um, comfortability is what I'm seeing. And then we do have about 30% quite comfortable and 30% slightly comfortable. So we're all kind of gathering towards that uh, middle level of comfortability. And then we have a sole participant who is extremely comfortable, and I'm so happy to hear that. I hope that's where we end up um, as we approach the launch date on December 1st. Okay, so our campaign is comprised of three different components. We are obviously focusing on the Cash for College component today. Our goal with this initiative is for every graduating senior to complete the free application for federal student aid before they graduate high school. And we really encourage that because that gives them access to the largest source of aid for education and training after high school. All right, next slide. 
So our agenda for today, we are going to ask what is the FAFSA and why should students and their families complete it? What are the steps to prepare for completing the FAFSA? And then what are some of the key updates for the 2025-26 FAFSA? So everywhere we have a key update, you'll see this little key icon as we move through our slides. So we just got your level of comfortability and we'll try to increase that as we go. So we'll go on to the next slide. So what is the FAFSA? The FAFSA is the free application for federal student aid and it is used to determine a student's eligibility for grants, scholarships, work study jobs, and low interest loans. So I think oftentimes folks, when they hear federal student aid, they think um, just of federal loans, but we really want to reiterate to students that it opens up the door to things like grants and scholarships and work study jobs. And why are we encouraging families to complete the FAFSA? Well, you'll see here that some research coming from the National College Attainment Network, they determine how many of our institutions within our state are considered affordable for low and moderate income families. And while our community college system is generally affordable, 73% of our community colleges are affordable to those families, our bachelor's granting institutions, only 31% of those are considered affordable for our low and moderate income families. So we see the need for financial aid so that these students are better able to afford post-secondary education. So the FAFSA not only gives access to federal aid, but many other kinds of aid. But within federal aid, there are many need-based options. So the FAFSA is really reaching those students who need financial aid the most. Most high school seniors in Alabama qualify for some kind of Pell Grant aid, and the maximum award for the Pell Grant is $7,395 per year, and none of that has to be paid back. So that's considered free gift aid. And we always like to point out the max award in comparison to the average cost of tuition and fees at a two-year college in Alabama, which is $5,039 per year. And that has actually dropped from the previous year. So it's gone down a bit. And that's why you saw on the previous chart that there is a high percentage of two-year institutions in our state that are affordable. So always a great option for students. So I'm not gonna go into much detail with this, but there are many different time, types of federal aid. So we know the Pell Grant is given to students who demonstrate financial need. That's up to $7,395 per year. We also have a few other grants as well that you see here that are either based on extreme financial need or family situation, or even the kind of career path that a student is taking when they're in college studying. Then we also have federal work study. So that's the opportunity for students to work while at college and use that money that they're earning towards tuition and fees. After that, we have several different kinds of loans. So the difference between all of these loans is um, who is paying interest while the student is taking out the loan. And then we have different types of aid for certain situations like international study and then military family. So all of these will be linked in the slides when you receive them in our follow-up email today. So feel free to look at all these different types of aid. So that was federal aid, but we also emphasize the importance of completing the FAFSA because it gives access to other kinds of aid as well. So that includes non-federal grants and scholarships. So you'll see that sometimes organizational scholarships, like from your local community organization, they'll ask for a record of FAFSA completion as um, part of the requirements for a student to apply for a scholarship. So it's not just for federal aid, it's for many other types of aid as well. And then we highlight that there are many positive outcomes associated with completing the FAFSA, such as positive increases in enrollment, persistence, and attainment. 
And all of this matters because more than 45% of Alabama's class of 2024 did not complete a FAFSA, which essentially translates to them forfeiting millions of dollars in free federal aid that would have been available to support their post-secondary pursuits. So we have some data here from the class of 2024. And on the right hand of the screen, you'll see the estimated percent of seniors completing a FAFSA. Alabama is that orange line, so it's just above uh, the national line in blue. So 54.3% of Alabama seniors completed a FAFSA, surpassing the national rate of 52.8%. So it's awesome that we are ahead of the rest of the nation, but that number um, did decrease quite a bit from the previous year. Obviously, a lot of that can be attributed to all of the technical issues with the new FAFSA, um, but we are hoping to see an increase this year as both the technical glitches get resolved and everyone becomes more comfortable with this new FAFSA form. On the left, you're going to see the year over year percentage change. And we're actually all in the negative here. So um, the nation's year over year uh, decrease was significant. Um, and ours was as well. We were hovering around like a 15% year over year change throughout a, a lot of the end of this FAFSA cycle. And then here I wanted to highlight something that we noticed with this year in particular. It seems as though the technical glitches with the new FAFSA were impacting more greatly students coming from lower income schools. So they completed the FAFSA at a lower rate than their higher income counterparts. So you see students at low income schools had a completion rate of 47.3 compared to their higher income counterparts, which had a completion rate of 59.7. So definitely hoping to close that gap this year as we bring in more and more resources to support educators. And we just hope you'll see us as a resource during this upcoming year. All right, so we kind of consider the FAFSA to be comprised of seven main steps. Today, we're really gonna focus on the first two. So like I mentioned at the start, um, this is going to be heavily focused on preparing for the launch date, and then we'll have other webinars that kind of go through the details of the FAFSA form. Really quickly, while we're still thinking about it, I want to address the question in the chat from Lisa uh, explaining the year over year concept. So when comparing the class of 2024 to the class of 2023, the class of 2024 had a 15% decrease in FAFSA completion. So it's just comparing the current year to the previous year. And obviously context is super important with that year over year change. So the big driver of that decrease was the new FAFSA having a huge delay and when it opened and then all the technical glitches that were happening with it. So hopefully that helps. Um, so the first two steps, step one, create an FSA ID, and then step two, gather documents. These should be done in advance of December 1st, and we have two resources that we'll cover in this session. We have an FSA ID creation guide and then a checklist for all of the documents that need to be gathered. All right, so I want to explain the word contributors before we go any further. So obviously a student is going to have their own FAFSA, and then there may or may not be certain people who contribute to a student student's FAFSA. So a contributor is any individual required to provide consent and approval for federal tax information along with their signature on the FAFSA form. And that includes the student themselves and then the student's spouse if they have one, and then a biological or adoptive parent or um, the parent's spouse. So that would be the student's step parent. So we'll talk about this more, but when someone is contributing to um, a student's FAFSA, they're also giving permission for their tax records to be pulled. So that's what the consent and approval means. 
And then they're also um, applying their signature to the student's FAFSA as they're adding their information. And a big part of this new FAFSA form is that consent and approval is required for the student to be eligible for federal aid. So without that consent, the student is essentially ineligible for aid. And we'll talk more about this in future slides. So step one, the FSA ID. So the FSA ID is just the username and password for accessing the student's federal student aid account. And it is required to start the FAFSA form. So you'll go to studentaid.gov to create this in advance of December. And because it takes around one to three days to authenticate an FSA ID, we really encourage y'all to get this process started now. There were several issues or challenges with the FSA ID creation process last year. So it doesn't hurt to get started in October or even early November. And part of that creation process is adding a verified email address. This is required. And students and their parents who are creating FSA IDs should not use a shared email address. So it shouldn't be a family email address. And then they also shouldn't use a temporary email address such as a work or school email address that they'll lose access to eventually. So here is our guide that I referenced earlier, how to create an FSA ID. So we give the link, we tell you to do it a few days in advance. What students will need is their date of birth, their social security number, their home address, personal email address, and a phone number if they have one. When they create the FSA ID, they need to be extremely careful to enter their name and social security number exactly as it appears on their social security card. So can't emphasize that enough. It will really help the process go smoothly if students are carefully typing this information. As they're creating this ID, they'll create a username and a password. Password has to be between eight and 30 characters in length. And then of course they have other stipulations for that as well. And then their password is case sensitive. And then a big part of the FSA ID process now is um, having a valid email address or phone number. So everyone has to add a valid email address. And it is ideal if when creating the FSA ID, they have immediate access to that email because when they're verifying the email address, they'll be um, pulling they'll be pulling an email and putting in a code to verify that that email address is indeed theirs. Same thing with a phone number. The student doesn't have to enter a stone number phone number, but we do highly encourage entering a phone number. Could you go back one side, please? We do highly encourage entering in a phone number because you'll that'll just be a second way of um, unlocking their account if they ever don't remember their username or password. So email address and phone number. Again, students should never use um, a shared email address. They should never use their parents' email address for their account, and they should never use their parents' phone number for their account. So. Everyone's FSA ID has to have different email addresses, different phone numbers. There should be no overlap there. And then the student will have to answer some security questions. So we just have a way for them to log the question and their answer. And then while they're creating the FSA ID, they're given a backup code, which serves kind of as another way for multi-factor authentication. So they can record that backup code on this guide as well. And I see a question in the chat about getting a copy of this presentation. We will send it in the follow-up email that goes out shortly um, after this webinar. If a student does not have a phone number of their own, the phone number is optional. We just highly recommend that if they do have a phone number, they're also listing it and then verifying it with the code so that they just have many different ways to access their account should they ever lose their username and password. But if they don't have one, then you can leave that blank. All right, we'll go to the next slide. So obviously the student needs an FSA ID to get started, but who else needs an FSA ID? 
sorry, we're getting lots of questions about this, which I kind of anticipated. So that's why we're only covering a couple of the steps for this webinar. So last year we would help them set it up and then the username and password wouldn't work. It, it sounds like a technical glitch based on the way you've described it. Um, if they're not able to use the username and password and then they try the other ways to unlock their account, um, that sounds more like a technical glitch. One thing that they shouldn't do they should never create a new FSA ID. You don't want duplicates because that will cause problems when the Social Security Administration is verifying the student. So every student is linked to one Social Security number and then also the, their email address and their phone number if they've added one. So creating a, another FSA ID would be the absolute last resort and really only if federal student aid hotline has advised you to do so. Sometimes they do have to do that because it's kind of the only way to get through a technical glitch, but it is a last resort. So I'm I'm thinking that what y'all encountered has hopefully been resolved, but please feel free to follow up with us if it hasn't been. Okay, so like I was mentioning, the student will need an FSA ID, but then other people will as well. So some students will need to invite people to contribute information to their FAFSA, and these contributors will also need an FSA ID. And who contributes to a student's FAFSA is going to, to depend on a student's dependency status. So dependency status is going to be determined by a student's response to a set of questions, and we'll look at those questions in just a moment. But often when we hear, I think just generally, when we hear dependency, um, what immediately goes off in our mind is federal income tax dependency. And I just wanna clarify here, say it straight from the beginning, um, federal income tax dependency is totally separate from FAFSA dependency. There are two totally separate sets of criteria. So if someone says, oh yeah, I'm a dependent and they're just talking about taxes, that's completely irrelevant to the FAFSA. All right, so what I have for you is what federal student aid has for the dependency questions and they actually have not updated them for the 2025-26 FAFSA. Um, but I'm sure they'll do that in the month of November. So hopefully you can see my browser. So these are the questions for last year, and then they'll be updated with the correct years for this upcoming FAFSA. But essentially what it's asking is when the student was born, if they're married, if they're working on a master's or doctorate, if they're serving on active duty, if they're a veteran, if they have children of their own who they're providing su support for, if at any time since they turned age 13 they were an orphan, a ward of the court, or in foster care, if they were legally emancipated minor, if they were in a legal guardianship, or if they were unaccompanied and either homeless or self-supporting and at risk of being homeless. So you don't need to memorize all these, but essentially if a student answers yes to any of this, these questions, they're considered independent for the purpose of the FAFSA. And so what we did, because these are for last year and I obviously wanted y'all to have um, this year's, let me see if I can move this. Um, we created this, checklist that we'll come back to and I'll zoom in. But the first part is confirming if you are an independent or dependent student. So you are an independent student if at least one of these is true about you. So it, it only has to be one. If none of these apply, then the student is a dependent student. So essentially the FAFSA is just going to be asking students questions and as the student responds, the FAFSA will determine yes, you are a dependent student, you need to provide parent information, or no, you are an independent student, you do not need to provide parent information. So yeah, we have this checklist in our educator's toolkit and we'll reference it a few different times today. So we can go to the next slide. To reiterate, independent students, the only people who will need an FSA ID is the student themselves and then if they're married, their spouse if they did not file taxes together. So 
That really doesn't apply to many of our high school seniors. For the vast majority of our seniors, they are gonna be dependent students. So they're gonna to need to provide their own information as well as parent information. And so when we say parent, you think that would be straightforward, but it's actually not very straightforward. So part of the FAFSA is determining which parent needs to create an FSA ID and report their information. And that's going to depend on several factors. So there is an incredible new tool called the Parent Wizard Tool that allows students who are dependents to see who should be contributing information to their FAFSA. And that will also tell them who needs to create an FSA ID. And then we also have our classic flow chart that is my parent a contributor flow chart that will give that same information. So we'll go to the next slide. So this is the flow chart and it's probably too hard to see. It is in our educators toolkit. So once again, if you wouldn't mind stopping sharing, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. I apologize for the speed of my laptop today. <laughs> it's not doing us any favors. Okay, so we start off with a definition of parent. A parent means your legal, so either biological or adoptive parent or person, the state is determined to be your legal parent. A step parent is considered to be a parent if they have adopted you. Step parents that have not adopted you will be identified as a parent spouse. Okay, so we'll move through this flow chart. The first question is, are your biological or adoptive parents married to each other? Your parents' marital status is, so if you're answering yes, your parents' marital status is married, not separated. Both of your parents' information must be included on the FAFSA form. If your parents did not file taxes jointly, then both your parents are contributors. Their individual information, consent and approval, and signatures will be required. If your parents filed taxes jointly, one parent is required as a contributor, then we'll report information for both parents. So if your parents are married and are filing taxes jointly, only one parent needs an FSA ID to contribute. If they're married and filed taxes separately, both parents will need FSA IDs and will contribute separately to the student's FAFSA. So what if your parents are not married? So we answer no to this question. The next question is, do your parents or adopted parents live together? If yes, your parents' marital status is unmarried and both of your parents are contributed, contributors, even if they were never married or divorced or separated. So their individual information, consent and approval and signatures will be required. So if your parents are not married but are living together, they're both going to need to create an FSA ID and then they're both going to need to contribute to your FAFSA. So what if your parents aren't married, aren't living together, then what? Did one parent provide more financial support than the other over the past 12 months? So say the answer is yes. Then the individual who provided more financial support will provide their information, consent and approval and signature. If they're remarried, they're also gonna provide the information of their spouse. If your answer to this question is no, so meaning that the parents are providing equal amounts of financial support, then you're going to include the parent who has the greater income or assets. If that parent is remarried, then you're going to include their spouse as well. So this is a flow chart just to get us familiar with how the FAFSA is determining who is a parent that has to contribute to a FAFSA. Um, what we also have now is a very great tool called the Parent Wizard that allows the student to enter in their parents' first names, and then it will ask them the questions to determine who should be contributing. So I'm gonna stop sharing one more time, go back to our slides. So we're gonna go through a scenario and use the Parent Wizard to move through it. So our first scenario, Devin's parents are divorced. Devin lives with his mother, Anita, and stepfather, Oscar. Anita provides most of Devin's financial support. Devin sees his father, Jason, once a month. So I'm gonna pull up the parent wizard. 
So our parents are divorced. Devin lives with mother Anita, stepfather Oscar, and Anita is providing most of Devin's financial support. Okay, so when we go to our parent wizard, it takes a little practice to kind of get familiar. So we're thinking about the legal parents. So legal parents are biological or adoptive. Didn't say anywhere that the stepfather has adopted. So when we're thinking about um, our legal parents, we're thinking about the two biological parents. So we put in the names of the biological parents, we press continue. Are they married to each other? No, they're divorced. Do they live together? No, they don't live together. Which parent has provided more financial support over the past 12 months? We were told Anita does. Did Anita remarry? Yes, Anita remarried. So now the wizard is telling us who is the parent to report on the FAFSA. Anita is the parent to report. So the student will need to invite Anita on the FAFSA form, and it, the, it's giving you all the necessary information. So what the student has to worry about is inviting Anita. And then because Anita is going to report that she's remarried, then she is also going to include the spouse's information. And if they filed taxes together jointly, then only Anita will need to create an FSA ID. If they filed their taxes separately, then um, Anita will need to invite the stepfather to also contribute information. So it's gonna tell you exactly who the student should invite, and then it's going to say you know, what the parent will do after that. I think one easy way to get tripped up is to start off with this tool and put the maybe Anita and then the new spouse, Oscar. So it is kind of important to always just take, take a breath, think through the question, read the help options that are given to you. So the only way that Oscar would be put as a parent here as the stepfather is if Oscar had legally adopted um, the student. And then the next scenario. So Jasmine's parents, Esther and Sam are married they file taxes separately. Okay, so let's go back to our parent wizard. So we have married parents who are filing taxes separately. So we put in our two parents, they are married to each other. So both Esther and Sam are parents on the FAFSA form. The student will only need to invite one parent, Esther or Sam. So here's something we came across um, quite a bit last year with parents who are married. So when parents are married and filing their taxes separately, um, so this situation right here, if they're filing taxes separately, they're both going to need um, to create FSA IDs and both contribute to the student's FAFSA. If they filed their taxes jointly, only one parent should be required to create the FSA ID and contribute. So this situation, since they are filing separately, the student's going to need to invite one of the parents first. That parent will then invite the second parent to contribute. So um, what we heard from y'all last year is that for parents who did file their taxes jointly, when really only one parent should be contributing to the form, the FAFSA was for some reason um, asking for both parents. And we're gonna kind of show you where that can go wrong within the FAFSA form in just a moment. So scenario three, Raina's parents are divorced. She splits her time between them evenly. Raina's mother, Jane, earns $48,000 a year. Raina's father, Carson, earns $43,000 a year. Each parent is required to provide exactly one half of her support per the divorce settlement. Neither parent is remarried. So we'll go back to our um, parent wizard. And I've already forgotten their names. So we'll just do mom, dad. <laughs> so the parents are divorced. They do not live together. 
And when they provide the same amount of support, it's going to say if both parents provide an exact equal amount of financial support, um, select the parent with the greater income and assets. So mom makes 48,000, dad makes 43,000. So we're gonna select mom in this situation. Did mom remarry? No. So mom is going to be the only parent included on the student's FAFSA. The student will need to invite mom to the FAFSA form. And then the mom will indicate that she's single, so she won't need to invite anyone else. But this is a situation where parents are divorced. They're contributing financially um, to the student equally. So because of that, the FAFSA is going based off which parent has the greater income or assets, which in this case is mom. All right, we have one more or two more scenarios, I believe. Okay, scenario four. Walker has been living with his grandmother, Betty, ever since his parents, Kim and Jordan, got divorced. Betty has not legally adopted Walker and is not his legal guardian as determined by a court. Betty provides most of Walker's financial support and then Jordan contributes the rest. So we have divorced parents. The student is primarily living with the grandmother and that grandmother's not legally adopted the student and is not the legal guardian. But that um, grandparent is providing most of the student's financial report. All right, so we'll go to our wizard. So remember, who is considered a legal parent? Grandparents are not considered parents on the FAFSA unless they've legally adopted the student. So in this case, the student's biological parents are the ones we're going to list, him and Jordan. They are um, not married. They got divorced. They do not live together. And then which parent provides more financial support? So actually for this student, the bulk of the financial support is coming from the grandmother, but it mentioned that the rest of su the support is coming from Jordan. So we're gonna click Jordan in this instance. And then Jordan did not get remarried. So because of that, we're gonna put Jordan on the FAFSA and then Jordan's gonna create an FSA ID and contribute to the FAFSA. So I put this situation because I feel like oftentimes the complications we hear are that our students have so many different kinds of living situations. Not all students are living with their biological parents. Many students are living with an aunt, an uncle, a grandparent. For the purposes of the FAFSA, most often that aunt, uncle, grandparent is not going to be considered their FAFSA parent unless they have legally adopted the student. If they have not legally adopted the student, even if the student does not see their biological parent, they're going to have to list their biological parent on the FAFSA. There are some exceptions to this, and we'll touch on that in a few slides, but the FAFSA is really always trying to get to who is your biological parent, who is your adoptive parent. And we know that doesn't seem fair to our students who don't have that household structure. They have so many different living situations. But in order for us to complete the FAFSA correctly, we need to be answering these questions correctly. All right, I believe we have one more situation. Okay, so we have our student, Josh. Josh's father passed away when he was five. His mother, Julie, got remarried to Terrence when Josh was eight. Julie and Terrence file taxes together. Terrence has not legally adopted Josh. So in this case, when we're asked about legal parent, this is an instance where we're only going to list one. So we're going to check this box. The student only has one legal parent. So Josh's biological father passed away when he was a child. Um, because the step parent has not legally adopted Josh, we only list one parent. So Julie is remarried. So the student's going to invite the Julie to the FAFSA. Julie will create the FSA ID and contribute to the FAFSA. And because Julie's remarried, Julie will also include the spouse information, Terrence. 
And if they file their taxes together, then only Julie needs to contribute on both of their behalves. If they file their taxes separately, then Terrence is also going to need to create an FSA ID and contribute um, to the FAFSA. All right, I believe that is our last scenario, but I'm gonna leave a moment. Does anyone have any questions about this? I see a direct message really quickly. Let me read through that. So the question is, so if a student lives with grandmother, is not adopted, and no legal parents are contributing, contributing financially, I'm assuming you're saying, the parent will still need to provide parent info. Um, what if they are not in contact with the legal parents at all? So, yes, even if um, the parent is not providing financially, they are going to have to include the biological parent's information. Now, your second question about what if they're not in contact with the legal parent at all, that could come into play. There's something called unusual circumstances that we can get into, and we have a slide on that a little bit later on. And I think some of the messages coming through are kind of getting to that. Um, what if you have a student whose parent refuses to provide access to income? So we'll talk about this more when we talk about unusual circumstances, but unusual circumstances are pretty uh, concretely defined and they do not include a parent who simply refuses to provide access. So if a parent refuses, um, that's really unfortunate for our student, but it is not something that federal student aid considers an unusual circumstance. So the best that we can do is just continue to try to reach that parent, help them to understand the importance of their contribution to the FAFSA. And after that, um, the student can just kind of reach out to the financial aid office of their college to explain their situation. A couple more questions like that. What if the parents will not provide information? Um, kind of that same response I just gave. What if parents are divorced and only one claims the student as a dependent on their taxes? So income taxes are going to be completely irrelevant for the purposes of the FAFSA. If the parents are divorced, you're going to move through those other questions that the FAFSA asks. And so those questions would be um, which parent is providing the greater amount of support it does not matter who's claiming the student on their taxes. So taxes are irrelevant here. And I'll say from personal experience coming from the tax field um, with separated or divorced parents, people are often incorrectly claiming students on their taxes. Just tax law is so complicated. And I think the explanation of who should be claiming a student is so poor that it's often done incorrectly all the time. And that's why we're not gonna use tax dependency as in, 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 informational for FAFSA dependency. What if both parents are deceased and the student lives with grandparents? So I'm assuming that in this case, um, the grandparents have not legally adopted the student. So our checklist goes over that. So, um, one of the questions is at any time since you turned age 13, did you, were you an orphan? Did you have no living biological or adoptive parents? If the student answers yes to that, they're actually gonna be an independent student. So they're not gonna need to report parent information. So if the parents are deceased, that's, uh, we'd obviously need to know all the details, but it sounds like that a student is an independent student for the purposes of the FAFSA. Um, we had a large problem helping our students whose parents don't have social security number. The authentication process was a big setback. What we found was that it worked best if parents first made the FSA ID and then invited the student. Should we be doing that again this year? We will be addressing that in just a few slides. Thank you so much for bringing that up. So like we just saw with the parent wizard, um, it's going to tell you exactly who the student needs to invite in the parent invitation section. The student is almost always going to invite one parent. So what we saw time and time again last year when it came to the point of inviting the parent, 
there are these two columns for the student to fill out, like parent one, parent two. Students just automatically put both parents regardless. Um, we don't want to do that this year. So we want to put whichever parent the parent wizard is telling us to put. So even though the FAFSA is very confusingly giving you two fields to fill out, do not fill out both fields. Only fill out the parent that the parent wizard has told you to input. If a second parent needs to be invited, then in most cases, the first parent is going to invite that second parent. But for the student who's inputting the information, they're only going to put in that first parent they've been told to invite. So like I mentioned, in the case where a student can invite either parent to contribute, so this is really talking about when their parents are married and they file taxes together. So you're gonna have information about both of your parents on the FAFSA, but you really only need one of them to contribute on behalf of both. We advise that the student choose a parent that already has an FSA ID if that applies in this situation. So if their parents are married and they're filing taxes together and one already has a FSA ID from their college experience, the student would want to go ahead and just invite that one parent who has the FSA ID to go ahead and make things as simple as possible. So we're getting now to our parents who don't have social security numbers. So this is going to include our undocumented parents. Even without a social security number, they're still going to need an FSA ID. So when they're going to create that ID, there's a checkbox that they'll indicate that they don't have a social security number. Now, some of our um, non-social security holders have what's called an individual taxpayer identification number or an ITIN. This is what the number that they use to file federal income taxes. So even though they don't have a social security number, they still file federal income taxes and they use their ITIN to do that. They should not be putting their ITIN in place of the social security number. So they'll indicate instead that they don't have a social security number. And on the next slide, you'll see a screenshot of that. So they're gonna leave this blank and then click the checkbox. They're not going to put the I-10 where it says social security number. All right, next slide. So because they don't have a social security number, they're not going to be able to have the social security administration verify their identity. So they're going to have to verify their identity through an alternate path. And I'm sure many of you experienced last year, this alternate path was extremely frustrating. And so they're working to improve that for this upcoming cycle. But essentially what it looks like as you're moving through the FSA ID creation process, the page will give the parent without the social security number what's called knowledge-based verification questions. So if they see these questions and they're able to answer them correctly, I'll give you an example of one. It's like, which of these was a former employer or which of these was a former address where you lived? If they're able to answer that correctly, then their identi identity is verified and they have nothing else to do. If they're, if they're unable to answer correctly, or if they simply just don't see these questions because not everyone is presented these questions and that's on purpose, it's not a glitch. They're not presented the questions because there's no information found on this person, which honestly applies to a lot of our undocumented families. Um, in that case, they're gonna have to do two more steps. They're gonna have to complete what's called an attestation form. And then they're going to have to submit required identity documentation. The good news here, so this is an update that I am looking forward to, with the attestation form, it should, this upcoming cycle, be a form that they're able to just fill out online and submit. So they're not going to have to like print, fill out, email to a federal student aid email address. They're hoping to make it where it's just a simple form that they fill out and submit. And then there's also this documentation that they have to provide as well. So we'll go to the next slide. So this is an example of the attestation form. So hopefully it's not something that has to be printed this year, it's just done online. And then you see on the right, section five, 
These are the acceptable identity documents that you can submit to verify your identity. So there's a list there. We know a lot of our undocumented parents don't have um, these identity documentation. So one positive of this upcoming cycle, and I believe this is on the next slide, is that um, the identity verification process for non-SSN holders has once again been waived. So they're actually not going to be required to do this attestation form and the identity verification. They can just go ahead and proceed with immediate access to the FAFSA. But in future years, they will be required to verify their identity. So what uh, federal student aid is encouraging, and we are as well, if the parent is able to complete the attestation form and submit a document verifying their identity, we encourage them to do that now to just get that out of the way. If they're not able to do that, say because they don't have one of the approved identity documents, they can skip that for this year. So they will be able to complete the FAFSA without it, but this will be the last year that that is possible. And then, um, so this is what I believe Lindsay was mentioning in the chat. So typically what we recommend in just general circumstances, we generally recommend students invite their parents to contribute to the FAFSA. This is the one exception to that. Because last year there were so many issues with the students sending a parent invitation and then um, the system not being able to match that with a parent's FSA ID, for students who have parents that don't have social security numbers, we encourage the parent to start the FAFSA and then invite the student. That The matching process just seems more seamless. And I'll get into a little more detail, I believe, on the next slide. Okay, I actually didn't, so I'll, I'll just go into a little more detail right now, but no, I think it's, I think it's towards the end, so I'm going to save it for that, but I am going to pause just for questions before I get into unusual circumstances. Okay, what will happen to students whose parents can't provide proper identification? Um, so after this year where that identity verification has been waived, if the student has a parent who, without a social security number and they don't have one of the approved documents, I honestly don't know what a student will do. I believe, and I mean, we're going to all advocate against this, but I believe the student will somewhat be forced into saying that they're a dependent student who can't provide parent information, which will then limit the kinds of aid they're allowed to receive. That is just so totally unfair to our citizen students. Um, so I think there will be a lot of advocacy to push back against that. But I think following this FAFSA cycle, that would be what it would look like for a citizen student with non-citizen parents. Um, I know that uh, the community is advocating for the for federal student aid to accept more kinds of identity documents. So hopefully they keep adding to the list in a way that will include all non-citizen parents. And then another question to clarify, a new FSA ID needs to be made for each year that the student fills out a FAFSA. No. So if I said that, I misspoke. So the FSA ID will last forever. Um, but a student will have to create a new FAFSA each year to determine their eligibility for aid. But the FSA ID is your username and password that you use throughout this entire process. Oh, I just see I um, missed a question. If a student is adjudicated and temporarily confined to a state residential facility, is parent information required? I do, I do believe so. If they are because when you answer all of the dependency questions, that isn't one of the questions it asks. So I believe if they're not answering yes to any of the other dependency questions, they would still be um, a dependent student and would need to provide parent information. It would kind of just depend on their circumstances, but because it is also temporary confinement, that would lead me to believe that they are still dependent. 
Okay, I'm gonna, Josephine, I'm gonna save your other question um, towards the end. I think it'll be a little more relevant. Okay, so for our students who are dependent students, they obviously have to provide parent information, but the only time a student does not have to provide parent information is if they have something called unusual circumstances. Those unusual circumstances essentially allow them to receive a provisional student aid index without giving the parent information. And we're gonna define unusual circumstances in the next slide. But when a student indicates, hey, I can't provide my parent information, I have this situation, what they're gonna have to do after submitting their FAFSA is follow up with the colleges where they've applied to provide documentation and essentially prove they can't get parent information. So that documentation can look like record of interviews with say their um, counselor at school, records of phone calls, um, court documents, things like that. So let's talk about what unusual circumstances are. So a student may be experiencing unusual circumstances if they left home due to an abusive or threatening environment, are abandoned by or estranged from their parents, have refugee or asylee status and are separated from their parents, or are, their parents are displaced in a foreign country, if they're a victim of human trafficking, if they are incarcerated or their parents are incarcerated in contact with the parent would pose a risk. So actually, I, I think I answered your question incorrectly about the temporarily confined student. I might need to look into a more detailed definition of this, but I believe they might be able to put unusual circumstances if they are incarcerated and then um, would not have to provide parent information. It, it would kind of depend on the student's circumstance, like if they are able to get parent information, it might behoove them to do so. If they aren't able, then I think you would be able to use this unusual circumstance. And then otherwise unable to contact or locate their parents. I will kind of put caution towards this last bullet point. Um, I When we hear of students whose parents are refusing to contribute all the time i wouldn't want that student to just say oh i'm unable to get in touch like it, it really will need to be verified by the college that it's an unusual circumstance so we, we like we want to include as many students under this as necessarily fit but we don't want to just kind of throw in any student whose parent is refusing or is not complying. Um, so if the student can answer, yes, they have one of these circumstances, then they don't have to provide parent information. And then someone asked, just making sure the homeless question is right before this one. That is where our students through McKinney Vento fit in. So yes, um, when it asks the students all of the different dependency questions. It is going to ask if the student is homeless or at risk of being homeless. So that would be prior to um, their unusual circumstances. But what's good about this question, you can see right above the yes, no button. If a student answered like, no, they are not homeless, but then they read this qualifier down here. It says, if the student's circumstances resulted in not having a safe and stable place to live, they may be considered a homeless youth and should review the answer to the previous question about being unaccompanied and homeless. So this is trying to catch those students like, hey, we know you said no to the homeless question, but we just want to let you know if you're like in an unsafe environment, you don't have a stable place to live, you might qualify as homeless. So it is trying to kind of catch all those students. But yes, it is the question before this, Lindsay. All right, next slide. A big part of November is preparing everything we need for the December 1st launch date. So I'm going to now share screen for our checklist that we made so that y'all can be working on that with your students leading up to December. So the first thing that we do is confirm if the student's independent or dependent. 
After that, we're going to start collecting information. So section two is all of the information that the student is going to need to collect. And not all of this is applicable. So let's go through the checklist. They're obviously going to need to create their FSA ID. So they're going to need to have that username and password handy to be able to log in and start their FAFSA on December 1st. Then they're going to need a picture or a copy of their social security card. So remember, they're going to need to ensure that their name and their social security card is exactly as it's listed. If they have a green card, they'll need a picture or copy of that. So we have our um, students who are permanent residents who are also eligible for federal aid. So they will need to include their a number on the FAFSA, so having their green card is helpful. If the student is filing their own tax forms, they'll need their 2023 federal tax forms. And then if the student is asked questions about their assets, then they're going to need to know their total current amount of cash, checking, and savings accounts. And then they're also going to need to know their net worth of their investments. If a student has any, I'll pull up what is included within investments so that we can talk about that in more detail. And then they're also going to need to know all of the colleges where they plan to apply or if they're a current college student, um, just the name of their college right now. So students are able to add up to 20 colleges and universities to their FAFSA. So I would encourage students to list even those colleges that they're just kind of considering, just in case they do end up applying. That way that school already has their FAFSA information. So I'm gonna proceed on to the parent section, which also talks about assets. And then at that point, we'll kind of pull up our asset resource together. So we know that our dependent students are going to have to provide parent information. This kind of reiterates everything we've already talked about in our flow chart. We also have a quick handy link to our parent wizard tool. So the student's gonna put the parent's marital status. They're gonna check um, if, the, if the parent that the parent wizard has instructed them to invite has created an FSA ID. So one or both parents for, um, most folks, they'll really just need to put one parent. They're going to list their parents' full name. So for the majority of our students who have citizen parents, we want to have the full name exactly as it's shown on the Social Security card. Um, for our students who have non-citizen parents, we want the full name exactly as it's listed on official government ID. Their date of birth, their Social Security or their I-10, here we do ask for the I-10, not because a parent would ever put that I-10 in place of the social security number, but because the FAFSA later on will ask a parent for their I-10 as a way to attempt to pull tax records. That system doesn't work right now, so it's not pulling the tax records, but we still want to enter the I-10 in where it's actually asked for so that when the system is fixed, um, hopefully it will pull in tax records. The parent's email address, this just matters like which email address the parent checks. It doesn't have to be the parent's email address that is associated with their FSA ID, um, just whichever address the parent most checks. The parent's move date to the current state, so it does ask um, the parent's date that they got legal residence in um, their current state. That question is a little bit confusing because federal student aid is really just using this for the purposes of understanding how long a student and their family has been in the state to determine their eligibility for state-based aid. When the FAFSA asks legal state of residence, that can kind of set off alarm bells for um, undocumented folks. So I, we just encourage you to answer the question as the move date to the current state. Then tax information. So for the 2526 FAFSA, it is asking for your 2023 federal tax forms. So those are the tax forms that we filed in 2024. So anytime from January until the tax filing deadline. 
So that's going to include our form 1040 and all of our schedules. So some parents might have many schedules, some might just have a couple. And then we also encourage um, having any supporting documentation that was used to file these federal tax forms. So that would be things like the W-2, 1099 forms, just in case there's a question we need to answer where we need to reference back to that. And then if taxes were not filed, what was the reason for that? And then we have all this other financial information. So the asset questions, current amount of cash, checking, savings, net worth of current stocks, bonds, mutual funds, 529 plans, net worth of investment, rental property, rented portion of your home, net worth of parent-owned business or businesses and or family farm, and then amount of child support received in the last complete calendar year for all children, as well as the federal benefits received in 2023 or 2024. So we know for many families, they might not have any of these assets that are investments or businesses or things. But for those that do have these kinds of assets, we do have um, a resource to reference. So this is our asset guide. It very clearly defines what the FAFSA means by investments. So while I'm not going to get into it in total detail right now, we do encourage you to always just look at the definition of these terms to make sure nothing is being left off. So this is our checklist. I mean, most student, students might have cash checking and savings, but I'm not too concerned about them having investments that they need to look up. That would probably just apply to any parent that is doing reporting. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing. We'll go back to our slides. So like I mentioned, this is in our educator toolkit. We'll go to the next slide. Okay, so those are really like the first two steps before we even start our FAFSA. It's just creating the FSA IDs and then gathering the documents. I wanted to cover a few things related to the application, um, just as kind of a primer for the launch date. So the 2025-26 FAFSA, it's what your high school seniors will be completing because it's used to apply for aid for fall semester 2025, so that fall right after they graduate, through summer semester 2026. And then we have the 2024-25 FAFSA that's used to apply for aid for fall semester 2024 through summer semester 2025. And we just wanna point this out because if you do have a high school senior who is planning to enroll in college the summer after graduation, they actually might need to complete a 2024-25 FAFSA, they would need to contact their specific college or university to ask if they should complete one because each university approaches it differently. So I just wanted to flag that. But for most of our students, they will not be completing the 2024-25 FAFSA. So if they start creating their FSA IDs, they're super excited and eager to start their FAFSA. I know everyone is. Um, we want to make sure that students aren't unnecessarily just going in and filling out the 2024-25 FAFSA so that they'll see that available to them. And if you have super motivated students, they might start it. Make sure to tell them that they are completing the 2025-26 FAFSA unless they're intending to do some summer school. Okay, so we've talked a lot about students inviting parents to their FAFSA. When they're inviting, what they're providing is their parents' name, their parents' date of birth, their parents' social security number if they have one, and then the email address of their parent. If the parent does not have a social security number, the student is instead going to provide a mailing address. And the tricky part of the FAFSA, which we hope gets resolved by December, but as of right now, it hasn't been. When they're providing the mailing address, it must exactly match the mailing address that the parent puts in when they're creating their FSA ID. So down to abbreviation, everything, it has to match perfectly. So for your students who have parents without social security numbers, make sure that as they're inviting a parent, if they are inviting the parent, 
um, they're looking at what their parent put for their mailing address and they can find that through their parents account settings when their parent is logged in. This matching issue is why we highly recommend that for students in this situation, the parents start the FAFSA and the parent invite the student. If any information is input incorrectly, they'll need to correct it in order for the invitation to be successful. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and answer a couple of these questions. So can students who do not have, oh, can students who do not have a social security number and do not fit the criteria in the statement on the FSA ID creation page, that criteria is, I am a citizen of the freely associated states. Can they create an FSA ID? You discussed how undocumented parents can get around the social security number requirement by completing the attestation process, but what about undocumented students? Great question. We're gonna go into this in a lot more detail in future webinars, but I'm gonna go ahead and drop a link in the chat because we got a ton of questions about this during the registration process. So students can complete a FAFSA or um, create an FSA ID, one and the same. Students can do that if they are a US citizen, um, a US national, if they are a permanent resident or if they're an eligible non-citizen. So I just dropped in the chat, who is considered an eligible non-citizen? There are a few different situations that allow a student to um, start a FAFSA without being a US citizen. So we'll talk about that in detail in a future webinar, but for the most part, there are going to need to have a social security number. Most of the students who are included under these non-eligible citizens do have a social security number and do have this unique circumstance. Um, the one that the page is calling out, the citizen of a freely associated state, they don't have the social security numbers. So they're able to create the FSA ID through a different process. So I hope that answered your question. Uh, what information or documents should, be, should parents be ready to provide if they did not file taxes for the 2023 tax year? So let's go to the next slide and talk about taxes. So the FAFSA has the new direct data exchange that's going to automatically transfer federal tax information from the IRS to the Department of Education. And in order for that to be pulled through, the contributor has to provide their consent and approval. And then any information that is pulled through is not going to be seen anywhere on the form. It's just an automatic process that pulls it in. So for folks who aren't able to use the direct data exchange, they will have to manually input their tax information. So they'll have to click through manually inputting tax information. Now say they haven't filed taxes at all. So they're gonna indicate on their FAFSA that they haven't filed taxes. Then they're going to answer financial questions uh, about their financial situation. So how are they earning money? So things that they can gather to support answering those questions are their W-2s, their pay stubs, their 1099 miscellaneous, all of these different forms that they're getting from their employer. If they're working under the table, they might not have that information. Um, essentially, they're going to need to answer all these questions about their final financial situation, whether or not they are filing taxes. Now, how that complicates things, and we'll go into this in more detail in another webinar, is that if the FAFSA is essentially showing I am earning money and I'm actually earning enough money to require me to file taxes, the college or university is going to receive that information and say, hey, you have a tax filing requirement, you need to file taxes. You know, they're not, there's no, they're not going to do anything about it other than be like, we need you to file your taxes in order for us to be able to extend an offer of aid to you. So essentially, it's just going to prompt a family who hasn't filed taxes to need to file taxes, which we know can be a challenging situation for folks who are undocumented, who might not have an individual taxpayer identification number. So that's all stuff that we would definitely be willing to work with you one-on-one -on -one with, and we also will address further in a webinar.
Okay, going back to the year of the FAFSA, so our high school seniors are going to be completing the 2025-26 FAFSA because they're applying for aid fall 2025 through summer 2026. So if they create their FSA ID and are super eager to get started, we don't want them clicking into the 2024-25 FAFSA. They need to wait until December 1st when the 2025-26 FAFSA launches. If they did go ahead and start the 2024-25 FAFSA, that's okay. They'll have it in draft. They can kind of just leave it sitting there. And then they'll get started when the 25-26 FAFSA opens. All right, next slide. So just like we mentioned, we're using prior prior year tax information. So for this tax, for this FAFSA cycle, it's going to be 2023 taxes. And then like the checklist recommends, we encourage families to have their tax returns and their supporting tax documents for reference while they're working on the FAFSA. So our um, organization was uh, honored to be one of six organizations nationwide to be chosen for beta testing for the 2025-26 FAFSA. So we got an early look at the new FAFSA and got to lead students through that process. Um, what we saw during that is that there's a known glitch with the direct data exchange that makes it appear like the system's kind of timing out while it's pulling all the tax information in. Um, it isn't actually an issue when the student logs back in, that information has been transferred, but it was causing confusion for several uh, students who thought that it just wasn't working. So ideally that will be resolved by December 1st, but just flagging it for all of our information as we head into the next FAFSA. Um, Josephine asks, can they delete the 2024-25 FAFSA if they created it? by mistake because they'll keep giving emails to finalize yes they can go in and delete thank you for mentioning that i should have said that as well um so that they're not continuously prompted to finish the fafsa it would be best to just delete instead of leaving it in draft all right next slide because i want to get y'all out on time so some key messages for our students the FAFSA is free to complete. If they're being prompted to pay for anything, it is a scam site. Make sure they're all going to studentaid.gov, fafsa.gov. It is um, used for technical and professional certificates and academic degrees. Like we mentioned, the Pell Grant, many students in Alabama are qualifying for that, which is up to $7,395 per year. It's also a requirement for many non-federal grants and scholarships. We really emphasize that, especially for those students who say, oh, I'm not gonna qualify for any kind of need-based aid. Well, your college might require it for some kind of merit-based aid. So just always good to complete the FAFSA. And then because each institution might have a different deadline for financial aid application, we encourage students to look at all the different priority deadlines at their colleges where they're applying. Next slide. So for our parents, we want them to know that the FAFSA is safe and secure. It's really only using their information to determine their students' eligibility for aid. So it's really trying to help their students not harm them. Their student needs um, their information to be able to complete the application if they're a dependent student. And then just keep reiterating, even if you think your family doesn't qualify for aid, it's good to have your FAFSA on file in case of the unexpected. We never know what our circumstances will look like next year. All right, so these are some resources. We have our educator toolkit, which I've been continuously pulling up and referencing. I'm dropping that in the chat right now. The National College Attainment Network also has a training toolkit that we've linked in the slides. And then federal student aid, we're really advocating for their hotline to be better and more accessible this year. So that's the number that students can call if they have an issue that we're not able to resolve with them. Um, all of the existing issues are documented on federal student aid's website, so you can check those out there. And then let's go on to the next slide. So we've been answering your questions all throughout. I'm gonna go ahead and get on to our survey. So I am going to launch our first set of questions for your eligibility for PD credit. So the first set is getting your feedback on satisfaction. Okay, I see a question from Heather, what qualifies a student to have to submit their federal tax forms? I'm interpreting this two different ways, so I'll answer it both ways. Um, if a student files federal taxes, then 
they need to report those federal taxes on their FAFSA. If your question is, when is a student required to file taxes? Um, students have a filing threshold the same as parents do. So I will go ahead and drop information for that um, in the chat. It's basically if they're exceeding a certain level of income and a few other criteria. So if you do have students who are working, um, it is always good to make sure they've filed taxes if they have to. And then I am going to launch the next set of questions. So I wish I had a neater version of this resource, but in the chat, I am dropping the IRS publication 17. And on page nine, is how you determine, oh, I just, I meant to message that to everyone. I messaged it to the person. <laughs> On page nine is how you determine if um, a student has a filing requirement. And it's really if a uh, dependent has a filing requirement. So it's things like, um, was your earned income more than 13,850? Was your unearned income more than 1,250? So you can look at those details on page nine. I will um, send out just something in the follow-up email in case folks miss this. I know we held you over. Um, when you are going into power school, you'll enter course number 322173, section number 510292. We'll include that in the follow-up email. And then if you weren't able to stay for the questions, I'll make sure you get these questions sent to you. All right, we'll go to the next slide. So here are upcoming events. We're excited to have our first community conversation hosted by a member of our Educator Advisory Council. That's coming up November 6th at 10.30 a.m. It's gonna be on the ACT and the upcoming changes to that. Um, the next day we have Alabama Possible's Forging Forward Dinner and Conversation that's hosted at the Florentine in Birmingham. So you'll have a link to the tickets if you would like to join us at 6 p.m. that night. Um, the next week, we're going to have another Cash for College webinar, this time focused on scholarships. We're going to have several awesome panelists join us for that conversation. And then just a reminder that we have the Alabama Counseling Association Fall Conference, November 19th and, or November 19th is the pre-conference and then 20th through the 22nd is the actual conference. All right, I'm gonna close out this poll and go to the next slide. Um, Josephine, I see your question. Hey, should a parent start the FAFSA through the beta program for undocumented students? I would probably advise that at this point, just based on the matching issues that are being experienced. If you have a specific situation you want to chat about, I would be more than happy to do that. I know I um, also didn't get to your other question. Um, oh, I think it was the same thing. Like, can the parents start the FAFSA? And I would recommend that. Um, yes, yeah, so our scholarship webinar on November 13th will also be a professional development opportunity. Um, if the student started, I don't have any hesitation about that. Just as you've always been advising them, if they start the FAFSA, ensure that when they're completing the parent invitation section, they're matching the mailing address information. So I want to delete and start over. I would just be cautious about that matching process. All right, let's go to the next slide. So our help desk, um, we know that this might be more utilized once December comes, but you can always text or call us at 334-316-6155. We hope to be your first line of defense when an issue comes up. Um, and if it has to be escalated to federal student aid, we'll make that happen. Um, but hopefully we would be able to help you before you have to get on the hotline with them. So feel free to text or call us through this. And then last slide, we just want to stay in touch. You can email us at alegoestocollege at alabamapossible.org. I really appreciate y'all hanging on and hanging in there. I'm going to get all of this information to you. 
via email. Um, so you'll have the slides and all of the relevant links at your fingertips. If you have any questions after this, um, feel free to follow up. I'm going to follow up with you individually if you submitted a question during registration and we didn't get to it out loud today. So be looking for that. But thank you all so much and we will definitely be seeing you soon.